Hello everybody, um, great to see so many of you on here um, and I'm really looking forward to working with you um, today and let's see where we get. So hopefully you've all got your little workbooks and we're going to work through, but I want each and every one of you to take something away from this and I've got lots of Q&As so I'll be doing um, that at the end. Now, many of you um, know me, but some of you don't. So for those that have not met me before or know a lot about me, I am a midwife, I'm an acupuncturist, I have a clinic in London, a range of products, I've written lots of books, and the whole holistic approach is what I'm um, known for. So I'm going to refer to my notes as I go along because I'm going to work on the workbooks, etc. So um, the reason that I started all of this was that I, um, you know, 34 years ago now, I um, suffered from postnatal depression. Can you put me about me up? Yeah. That one. Sorry about this. Okay, great. Yeah? yeah. Okay, sorry about that. So um, I, uh, 34 years ago, suffered from postnatal depression when I had my um, son. And you can't imagine back then, but there was no internet, there was no Dr. Google, there wasn't even any Amazon. So I had to do a lot of research for myself, most of it in the aisles of Blackwell's bookshop in Oxford at the time, taking notes. Um, and at that time, I didn't want to take antidepressants. I knew my body was depleted, having had a pregnancy of being sick for nine months. Um, lost weight, so I needed to research the nutrients to build me up. So that's when I started Zeta West products. Um, the emotional side, I, I used acupuncture. It was very fringe then, but it got me into acupuncture and I trained as an acupuncturist. So one of the things I love about what I do is merging the medical side with the holistic side, looking at absolutely everything from lifestyle to diet to supplements, emotional well-being in helping couples, women um, to get pregnant. Um, so I see a, a, a lot of women from all different areas of, of life. I see couples, I see single women, I see same-sex couples, I see women that are couples that are co-parenting or women that are going it alone. And I use the same principles, but on an individualized um, approach. So what I want you to get from this evening is I want you to think about you individually. I don't want you to think about anybody else or compare yourself to anybody else. This is about you and your plan. So you are in the right place tonight. Um, if you've been trying to get pregnant for a while, if you are worried about the tick tock of the biological clock, if you've had failed pregnancies or you're feeling anxious and stressed, but you know, you're all at different parts of the journey. Some of you will have just started. Um, you'll, be um, you'll be facing different challenges. Um, everybody enters fertility with their own challenges from the past, the present, past beliefs, um, stories they're telling themselves. But I think the biggest challenge all of you have on here this evening is dealing with uncertainty, not knowing when and if this is gonna happen for you. So I want to sort of help you Get your headset right, look at what nutrients you're taking, looking at your lifestyle and get you thinking about the energy you need to do a lot of this and to make it work for you. So here we are, January 2022. Nothing changes, does it? Um, we've all got our to-do lists and my to-do list looks very similar to this, apart from more sex and trying for a baby. I'm way beyond that. But, you know, the reason that none of these New Year's resolutions work is because a lot of this list is not achievable. And changes take the right mindset, focus, attention, commitment, willpower, and, and energy. And I think we've all been a little bit deceived, haven't we, that you can change your patterns in 21 days. That would be great if that could be done, but it's a bit unrealistic. So... You can replace one habit with another habit, but it depends on highly on the behavior. And just because you set a goal doesn't mean to say that you're going to do it. And no one fits all size fits absolutely everybody. So, you know, I want to make this as easy as I can for you. And when we're going through this workbook tonight, 
I want you to focus on less is more. And women say to me the whole time, what else can I do? What else can I do? I'm worried I'm not doing enough. And very often they're doing too much, but in a really unfocused way. So I'm asking you to use your energy tonight to focus on what is individual to you. So, you know, nearly every woman I see, I ask the question, is there anything stopping this from happening for you? And women don't have to dig too deep to come up with the answers. Um, you know, forget the medical side, forget what you've been told about your eggs, your sperm, your AMH, you know, any underlying conditions you've got. Um, you know, I want you to sort of think in a new way. So when I ask this question to women, the answers range from their beliefs and their stories that they've told themselves, sometimes from past traumas, sometimes from relationships, but it's negative labels, it's voices of authority uh, and giving you sort of titles, low responder, low AMH. These negative thoughts grind you down. Dealing with uncertainty on top of this is really hard. So, you know, looking at these women here, it could be you. I've always thought there'd be issues. I got pregnancy so easily the first time. I never thought I'd be doing this alone. I really believe that IVF would work the first time round. Um, I've had a termination in the past. Is that why I'm not able to get pregnant now? So a lot of it is stories you're telling yourself, beliefs you're telling yourself in your mind. So I want tonight to look at where you are now and where you need to be. So get your pens and papers ready. And the first thing we're looking at is the planning session for um, IVF and PrEP and trying naturally. And, you know, just taking into account that you don't have control over when and if you'll get pregnant, but you do have control over your mindset, your diet, the supplements you take, your lifestyle, thoughts, how you manage your emotions and your thoughts and your stress. But it requires a plan of action. So what I want you to first do is think about where you're now uh, medically. This doesn't, you don't have to write a lot down, just a couple of words. Then looking at, you know, what your, what's your diet like at the moment? How is your lifestyle? How are you um, emotionally? And just fill this in just very quickly without thinking too deeply about it. Hopefully you're doing all of that. So, you know, what is your challenge at the moment? What are you currently facing um, in your relationships, your friendships? your life plan, your fertility, you know, what are you struggling with? Is it relationship? Is it mindset? Is it lifestyle? Is it sleep? But also importantly, what is now using up your energy? What's taking your time and energy up? So you've got a little a column there to write some journal notes in as well. So that's all I'm going to do with that plan. And we will come back and revisit this whole area at the end of the session. So the next thing I'm going to move on to is um, emotional health. And, you know, without a doubt, the whole fertility trying um, is, a, is a roller coaster of emotions. And these strong emotions of fear and anger, worry and grief have a huge impact on our hormones, our stress levels, our negativity. And when you think of something like fear, it's a crippling emotion. Um, and when you're in a state of fear the whole time, which many women are, you don't grow on every level. You know, fear, you protect yourself from life, from relationships, from people, you become more isolated, but you don't become creative and you don't grow. Um, so that's what I want you to sort of think about tonight is what impact are some of these emotions on the chart um, doing it to you um, on every level of your life at the moment? So looking at this chart, going around and um, seeing where you are scoring in terms of the highest and the lowest, focusing what is the overriding emotion for you at the moment? Is it jealousy because somebody at work's had a child or pregnant? Is it grief? Is it worry? Is it anger? Um, and just sort of notice how you're reacting. And just sort of like fill in that form all the way around and just write a couple of notes as we go along on this session and um, this evening. 
So the next slide is about lifestyle. And lifestyle caused so many divides between couples and it becomes the tyranny of the shoulds. And men and women are very, when men and women are very different in their approach. You know, a woman will have gone out and been on Dr. Google, searched the whole internet for what she needs to take, do, read, etc. And men very often are more optimistic than you are in terms of, don't worry about it, it will be absolutely fine. So just look at this chart and again, score the highest um, and the lowest so that you can see where the weaknesses lay in your sort of lifestyle, etc. So, you know, what are your relationships like, not just with your partner, but with your friends, your family, your work colleagues? How often are you relaxing? How stressed are you? How much energy are you using up with your emotions and also in different areas of your lifestyle? For example, if you're not sleeping, you're depleting yourself of energy. If you're not exercising, if you're working long hours, if you're spending long time on uh, the internet or digitally, you are going to be depleting yourself of um, nutrients and, 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 and gaining stresses. So just think about this for a minute and fill in this as well. So what I'm going to do next, once you've done that, I'm going to give you a couple of seconds, is I'm going to be moving on to talk about the common scenarios I see with women, be it if they're trying naturally or if they're going through IVF, which holds them back on some level. Um, I'm going to go through this and then I'm going to look at mindset and then I'm going to sort of look at nutrients and we will come, when we get to the end, we will revisit these charts. I'm going to answer the Q&As um, and, you know, there will be time for questions and I might have to move over to IGTV to do a lot of the questions because of the time factor on Zoom. So the first thing that I always, um, always see is the TikTok of the biological clock. And for those of you that are just starting off, every week in my clinic, I see a woman at 34 who's in a major panic that her eggs are going to fall off a cliff at 35. Looking at the fertile window as well, which is five days before ovulation, the day after, women worry that that's going to get shorter as they get older concerned about timing, you know, which is an important factor. Looking at the pill, thinking you've got to wait till it comes out of your system, which isn't correct. And I will go on to talk about that. And the main focus is being on ovulation. Now, this biological clock, this uh, term was coined in 1978 by a journalist in the Washington Post with these horrendous headlines, the clock is ticking for career women. Um, and this has caused such psychological pressure for so many women. So, you know, what is the biological clock? You know, all of our cells in the, in the body have an internal clock. So you think of the sleep-wake cycle, you think of your mental cycle, menstrual cycle, you think of your traveling and you have jet lag. What it is really is we know we, we all age. We know that fertility ages and um, declines. Um, but it's pointless worrying about this, and I'm going to explain why as we um, go along. So the same myth, you know, age, time frame and delays do cause, cha do cause challenges, but time pressure comes also from our society, and that's difficult because there's no right age to have a baby. You know, yes, if you're 16 or 17, it's probably your prime time, but are you ready mentally and emotionally at that age? Um, and it can be disheartening, I know, when others around you are conceiving as well. But the reality is using all this energy to worry about your eggs is only going to add um, to your stress. And, you know, without a date, doubt, age does have an impact. Um, for me, the reason age has an impact is that I manage women's expectations every day of the week. And on average, it can take eight months to conceive. So many women are more fortunate, they get pregnant very, very quickly indeed. But the reason for delays is that, you know, if you're trying in your early 30s or in your mid 30s or if you're 40, what very often happens, it can take you eight months to get pregnant. Miscarriages are so, so, so common first time round. You've got to gear yourself up to try again. Um, so you can see how at 32, 33, 
18 months on, you're at 35, 36. So, you know, you do need to be strategic about um, your fertility. Um, and it's quite interesting, isn't it? Because women are strategic about most areas of their life, their work, their home life, their, fancy, uh, their finances. But when it comes to fertility, it's a bit um, woolly and over there somewhere up in the cloud until you think about you wanting to have a baby. So time, a time frame, a strategy and a plan of action, I think is really important. Your eggs do not fall off the cliff at 35. So some women are more fortunate than others when it comes to their egg reserves. So some women at 40 have got high egg reserves. Some women at 35 have lower egg reserves, but you still stand a better chance at 35, even with lower egg reserves, because you've got younger eggs. But fertility isn't black and white. There's lots of shades of gray. So, you know, I'm going to come on and talk about um, eggs and testing. Um, it doesn't mean to say that you won't be able to get pregnant, but it does give you in insight into how you need to strategize and think about how long you're trying naturally before you move on to a more assisted route. <clears throat> so just let's look at eggs for a minute. Okay, so, you know, a woman is born with all the eggs she's ever, 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 ever going to have. And yes, they are genetically determined. And women are told this all of the time. So that's where the panic comes. It's like, oh my God, my eggs are going to fall off a cliff. I look at two things when I see a woman. I look at her age and I look at the time that she's been trying for. And when I say trying, I mean really, really trying. Having sex, you know, being a good weight, um, doing everything she can to make this happen for her. But I'm also a realist. You know, I like women to try for a few months on their own without over-medicalizing everything. But I'm a realist in that there's a fine line when you get to 38 or 39 between how long you try naturally before you move on to doing something like IVF. So, you know, can you test your fertility status? Yes, you can. There are tests you can do, blood tests called AMH, anti-malarian hormone. And also another scan called an antral follicle count. So the antimalarian hormone is a blood test which detects a marker in the ovaries that is able to come back with a reference range for your age to tell us how many eggs you've got left or what your egg reserves are. Now, obviously, the higher the number, the better. If you've got an underlying factor such as polycystic ovaries, it's not going to be accurate. The antral follicle count scan as well. Um, will tell how many follicles are on each ovary. So it's a good indicator of your egg reserves. Also, how you're going to respond if you're going down an IVF route and what chances you have of how many eggs you're likely um, to produce. But it tells you about the amount, but it doesn't tell you about the quality of your eggs. But the bottom line about quality is the older you are, the poorer quality of the eggs. But if you're older and you've got a good egg reserve, you still stand a really good chance because you've got more choice with the more eggs that you that you have. Um, so I just want to sort of like, you know, give you a take home message. If you're listening to this and you're single and you've only just started trying, I wouldn't put you down a route of doing all of these tests and over medicalizing this far too soon because what you've got to remember for every test you do there's always a result so if you're single if you're on your own you haven't met a partner and you're not prepared to do pregnancy on your own it's like the sword of damocles hanging it hanging over you i had so many women that have done this to say to me oh i just wanted to know what my reserves were um i wanted to know how you know how long i've got Nobody can tell you how long you've got because infertility, it's not black or white. There's so many shades of grey. So, you know, it's good to do. It's, you know, but try naturally first if you've got the time to be able to do that without over medicalizing it. Because this is just one test. It doesn't tell you whether you're ovulating. It doesn't tell you any underlying factors either. So really consider it before that you, um, you do it. One of the things that's important as well about eggs and fertility is if your mothers have an early menopause, the chances are you might follow. 
So you may want to start thinking sooner rather than later trying for a baby. But, you know, when I look back over the last 20 years, there are so many choices for women. You know, years ago, you either had a baby or you didn't have a baby. But today's women, you can go on to egg freeze, which I'm a huge advocate of, as long as you've got the good egg reserves and you know you've been properly counselled that do, doing um, egg freezing doesn't always guarantee um, a baby. Um, but I think it's great that we can um, assess fertility now. Again, you know, if you've been trying over a year, you go and see your GP. It's very difficult at the moment um, accessing fertility services and tests, I know. But I honestly think that if you are over 35 and you've really been trying, um, I think you should start to look at having some tests done. But also looking at underlying factors of what's gone on for you and your partner. You know, your partner may have undescended testicles as a child, that can have an impact. There's certain autoimmune disorders that might have um, an impact. You know, what you've got to feel, no matter what stage of this journey you're at, listening to this, is that you've ticked every box and you know exactly what you're going to be doing and maybe you need to move on. But you want to satisfy yourself before you do move on. So the next thing I see so often with so many women is tracking ovulation with apps. Now, there's nothing wrong with an app. And I understand that the technology over the last five years has changed so much. And we've all got apps, apps and gadgets and gizmos. Um, and, and lots of women think it gets them pregnant faster, plus the ovulation sticks, plus the thermometers and charts, and plus Dr. Google. I mean, it is technology bombarding you on absolutely every level. And you know what I feel sad about for women, and I totally understand why this fear around fertility has happened is that many women go on the pill at 15 and they don't come off at 35 until they're 35, until they start thinking about having a baby. So they have no idea about their natural fertile cycles or their fertile window. And so for some, there's a delay in their periods coming back. Some have irregular periods, but don't wait for the pill to come out of your system. You're likely to be more fertile when you first come off the pill. So just, um, just remember that. I mean, there's nothing wrong with, it, with, with, with apps, but get to understand your fertility as well. It's so important. These apps are really useful and helpful, but they don't provide long-term solutions. And we're all obsessed today with our phones and believe the answer to everything in our lives revolves around technology. And I think we need to look more inside for the answer. And the reality very often is it's an obsession and it's impacting on your relationship as well. So these apps are stopping you listening to your body. They're creating a technology overwhelm. The more data you have, the more obsessed you are. And science says that phones are breaking down relationships. So the obsession with apps is making you more stressed, putting you under pressure. And there's a phrase that, I, the phrase that I've coined, which is the four Ps, which I'm going to talk about, which is pressure, passion, performance, and panic, which we will move on to. Now, this is an absolute corker. All you need to do is relax and it will happen. And it is infuriating because you cannot tell a woman who is trying for a baby at any stage while she has still got fertility that going on holiday, you'll get pregnant. And that's what people do. They come up to you and they say, oh, my friend went on holiday and she got pregnant. Oh, my friend did yoga. My friend went on retreat and got pregnant. Um, you can't, you know, you can't do it. It's very hard for women to relax. You know, you're always looking for answers. And these are only surface level changes. They will have an impact, but only short term. What you need to do is you need to look at rewiring your brain by going into your subconscious to make significant changes in your mindset. Because I've talked about the labels and beliefs. Many of you here will be listening tonight. You need positive reinforce reinforcement. It's just as powerful as negative reinforcement. And getting pregnant is subconscious. We don't think about it. It's easier to achieve, but you're thinking about it the whole time. So managing your mindset. And, you know, when you are in a good mindset, you can achieve anything because you feel focused, 
you feel that you're managing better, you're dealing with uncertainty, you're not fatigued, you're not tired, and you can do it. So I'm going to talk briefly on this as we go along, but I will come back on if you want me to, to talk about stress and techniques that you can use, but there's not time in this tonight. So <clears throat> another myth with IVF, um, oh, it's just a numbers game. There's nothing you can do to improve your chances. You can't improve your eggs. There's no need to prepare for IVF. It doesn't matter if you're stressed um, or not. Well, I don't agree with any of that. You know, preparation is absolutely key, especially for IVF, four to six weeks before you go through IVF. And the reason preparation is key, mind, body and spirit, is that you would never prepare for a marathon without at least going out and running. You would never, as a woman, buy your wedding dress on a Friday to get married on a Saturday. You know, you, it's, like a, you know it's like a military operation, major events in our lives. And IVF is the same. You know, I, I, you know, it's one area of medicine that you can pay so much for and get so little. So you need to sort of look at everything that you can do that's in your power, that you've ticked all those boxes and you look back and you don't have any regrets. So you can improve your, improve your eggs and sperm. And I'm going to come on, on and talk to that as I get to the nutritional part. You can change your mindset because you do have control over your thoughts and emotions, but it all takes practice. There's only so much you can do on a conscious level. Everything else happens subconsciously which is why long-term positive change is um, important. So moving on to the four Ps, and this is what I see every day. So, you know, let's face it, when you first start out trying for a baby, you know, it's exciting, that switch goes on, sex is absolutely fantastic, you're all loved up and you just wait and see what happens. Well, give it, you know, six or eight months, Friends are getting pregnant, people are going down IVF, getting pregnant. It absolutely starts to floor you. And, you know, women are ruled by their moods, their form, their, their foods and their hormones. So the pressure starts to get intense for both you and your partner. And what starts to happen is the pressure builds up around ovulation because a woman will have her app, her apps and her thermometer and get focused on the fact that this egg is only going to last for 24 hours. Um, and she's starting to get into a panic around ovulation day and her poor partner is text at work, you know, ovulation tonight, come home early um, or else, you know, this egg is going to go and that's another month wasted. So it's absolute panic for him um, because he knows when he gets home or he's late, it's going to cause stress, an argument and a, no sex and another month gone. So it's really, really important that you, you know, that we look at the science behind um, all of this and the effect that the pressure and the panic is having on you. And I see young men with huge performance anxiety because they cannot cope with be, having to perform on that particular night. They just cannot do it. So looking at what you can do to help one another is really, really, really um, important. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about that now. Um, so, you know, for me, all I am interested in is getting the sperm to the egg and taking the pressure off. And I don't care how that happens. So I try and encourage a couple to take the pressure off. If there's performance anxiety, looking at what you can do and i know it's not romantic and i know it's very technical but it's self-insemination and i'm happy if anybody dm me after this to tell you what to do it's a bit too graphic to talk about on this tonight but what it does is it takes the pressure off that you don't have to have actual penetrative sex you can do something beforehand and you know that is great because it helps the couple so much know that the pressure is taken off them I also encourage women, do not focus on the egg. Focus on the sperm. And the reason you focus on the sperm is that if you are, the sperm lasts for three to five days. So if you are focusing on the sperm and you are having sex three to five, three days to, uh, to five days um, through the week, every week, then you are ensuring that there is plenty of sperm up around the egg when it comes out. Because ovulation 
is a random event. You can't pinpoint when it's going to happen. But with the life of the sperm, it's much better because you know that it can still be happening even if you're not having sex. The mistake a lot of couples make as well is that they um, stop having sex after ovulation because quite frankly, they're so relieved it's all over and they don't have to do it. It's the same when you do IVF. You know, women will think we don't have to have sex anymore because we're doing IVF. That's not the case. Have as much sex as you can because the amount of women that I see in the clinic that cancel their IVF cycles because they've got pregnant is huge. So looking at focusing on the sperm, don't save up the sperm. After ovulation, I know it's the last thing you probably want to do is have sex, but you've got to keep the sperm moving. And the reason why is that if you don't have sex after ovulation, then you wait for your period and then you rev up again to have sex. A lot of the sperm is going to be dead because it takes four to five ejaculates to get that sperm healthy. Um, and moving again. So just take all of these little things um, into account because, you know, they are important. The other thing I take to take the pressure off is men and women are very different in their approach to trying naturally and going through IVF. A woman will want to talk about it and talk about it and talk about it. A man doesn't want to do that. So limit the amount you're talking about this and don't make it the sole thing that's going on um, in your life. And I feel very sad when I ask a couple or a woman, you know, are you having any fun in your life? And very often it's like, no, we're not having any fun because um, trying for a baby and, you know, trying for a baby isn't that, that much fun. We've stopped going out for restaurants. We're not eating because it's bad for you and your fertility. You've got to get a bit of a life back and some treats built in. Um, and the other thing is, don't tell your man every minute detail of what's going on in your life. It's the biggest passion killer um, going, plus the fact the app and the beep, beep, beep of the thermometer every morning. Try and get some normality back into your life listening to this tonight. You know, go away. Think about the pressure you can take off one another, trying naturally or going through IVF. Think about the fun you can get back, in, you know, get back into your life. And I just want to go through some of the common questions now that I get um, that I get asked. Um, positions, you know, what position is best? Any position, swing from a chandelier if you want to, it doesn't matter. It's about passion, lubricants. There are a lot of sperm friendly lubricants now that you can use. You don't have an, to have an orgasm to get pregnant. Penetration doesn't matter either if it's deep, light, whatever. The sperm, the good sperm, will get up to that um, egg as soon as it can. Yes, you can lie fat for five or ten minutes afterwards, but you don't have to put your legs in the air, do handstands, it doesn't matter. A lot of women ask me about flow back. They're worried that all the sperm is falling out of the vagina. That's not the case either. This is a physio physiological thing that happens um, with the residual sperm, so don't worry about it. Don't save up the sperm. Have sex as often as you can. You can't have too much sex. But try and get a bit more passion um, back into it. And also a bit of kindness together. Because, you know, what I see when this has been going on for a long time is you can become unkind to one another and it does affect your relationship. So by having a plan, by working with a time frame, at least you've got things you can move, um, you can move on to. So, you know, my whole thing is about fertility being a whole body event. It's not just something that happens in the fallopian tubes. It happens all over the body. So mind-body connection is critical to all of your body systems. They're all interconnected via the nervous system. So your thoughts and your emotions have an impact on your heart, your brain, your gut, your uterus. The diet and nutrients you take in, the same. Your gut, there's so much we know now um, about the gut and gut health. And it's not uncommon for me to see many women on my questionnaire that have got irritable bowel syndrome, diarrhea, constipation. If you're not absorbing in your gut, you're not getting the nutrients through to make the hormones you need to make eggs. Your heart, you might say to me, what's my heart got to do with um, fertility? 
I work with women's hearts and wounds every day. And in my role as an acupuncturist, the heart is a seat of our emotions. And certainly um, now we've got a much better understanding with neuroscience that there is more than one intelligence in the body. So the brain um, makes neural, uh, has neural networks and intelligence, which we all know about. Um, and it can change and make more, more neurons and grow. And the heart also is a brain in itself. It has neurons, can release um, neurotransmitters. And the gut, you know, our immune, 95% of our immune cells in the gut make serotonin, and they're all connected by the nervous system. So when I talk to a woman about her heart, I, I very often sort of will ask the question, how, how does your heart feel? And just the language that's used, I'm heartbroken, I've got heartache, um, I feel anxious in my heart, my heart is heavy. Um, any dynamic shift in your emotion doesn't happen in your brain, it happens in your heart. So, you know, I will come on at a later time and talk about techniques that you can use um, to, you know, to help with this. Um, and very often what it is, it's spending 20 to 30 minutes a day through meditation, through visualization, through breathing, through yoga, all of these things are crucial and really, really important. And, you know, when you think about stressors in, in life, stresses aren't just about feeling stressed and producing adrenaline and cortisol. You have stresses in your, you know, affect your body in terms of fatigue and tiredness and headaches emotionally those strong feelings you feel anger fear grief um, is affected and also nutrients you know if you're eating um, badly behavioral stresses you know when your period comes IVF fails you know you drink you smoke you don't exercise you're not motivated you're depressed so this affects all of your bodies not just your fallopian tubes and um and, and you know and the eggs so it's important that we look at everything as a whole and you know what's required is energy and so you know when you're living your life very stressed you are depleting yourself of um, energy so with the nervous system which goes throughout the whole of your body and it connects your brain your heart your gut and your uterus and there are two arms so there's the autonomic nervous system has sympathetic nervous system and that's when you're stressed and in a state of fight and flight and it also has the parasympathetic nervous system and that's when you're calm and you're relaxed and that's the mode I want to encourage you to get into every single day for 15 to 20 minutes through breathing and through guided visualization and you know when you think about it you know when you wake in the morning we all wake with a thought and that first thought we have sets our day so by being able to breathe to practice a thought or to think about something positive or something you want to achieve in a day it makes you calm for the whole of your day and puts you in that parasympathetic mode so i encourage women to put their hand on their heart if they're stressed breathe take yourself out of the situation for five or ten minutes that's all it takes and again you know energetically with the work i do with acupuncture the gut, um, so many women hold emotion in their gut, and um, the gut's capable of releasing serotonin, which is the feel-good hormone, um, and also the microbiome that we know so much more about now um, is in the gut. So, you know, look at all of this and work out where you feel tense in your body, whether it's in your heart, your gut, where you feel things emotionally, and seek help, breathe, do yoga, meditation or whatever will help you so just looking at this quickly this is the conscious and subconscious mind the subconscious is below that water level here it stores our memories from the past present holds our fears and our dreams has no ability to, th to think critically it's designed to protect us and it follows the path of least resistance so these stresses that you have, these stories that you repeat to yourself, the niggle that it's never going to happen for you, the termination you've had, rep repetition of these intrusive thoughts that you have, 
um, are all impacted in the subconscious. And it doesn't discern between what's real and what's imagined. Therefore, it accepts and stores these negative memories and emotions as true. So that's why I want to encourage you to look at ways that you can strengthen these neural pathways in the brain, in the heart, and in the gut um, positively, because they will strengthen. The more you think negatively, those pathways will strengthen more negatively. When you think more positive thoughts, those pathways will strengthen more positively and make you feel so, so much better. Um, so doing visualization is one of the most powerful tools that we possess. These visualizations help you to feel calm and centered. And you know, it's important that you connect back to you, especially to your heart, because what happens when you're stressed, when you're going through this for a long time, you disconnect from your heart because you protect yourself. And when you disconnect from your heart, you stop uh, connecting with anything around you, people, socializing, fun, happiness, um, love, kindness, all of those things are really important. I have got visualizations. If you look in the bio on my Instagram, it will take you through to where you can find more information about visualizations. So moving on now, the next thing that women always ask, whether they're trying naturally or going through IVF is, is there anything I can do to improve the eggs and sperm? Um, Women are ruled by their moods, their foods, and their hormones. There is a lot you can do to improve your eggs and sperm, which I'm going to sort of talk about as we go along. But, you know, it's getting, it's getting into your head. There is no such thing as a balanced diet. It just does not exist. Women are far more likely to carve, crave, uh, crave carbs closer to the time when they're having their, their period. Um, a balanced diet doesn't exist, you know, for many women, it's the tyranny of the shoulds and the shouldn't. And they beat themselves up if they have that glass of wine, that cup of coffee or that cream cake. You've got to make it easy for yourselves, because if you make things too tough, too restrictive, you're not going to be able to manage it. It's not just going to, to work. And there are so many food fads now. Um, and I think that you've got to be aware of that. You know, I'm a huge believer in full fat foods. You know, I don't believe in um, margarines or, you know, low fat, this, that, and the other, because a lot of the good stuff is, is, is taken out. Um, full fat milk is important. Women are very short of iodine now, which is important for ovulation. The ovaries hold a huge amount of um, iodine. Also, being vegetarian and vegan, there is absolutely nothing wrong with that, but it can cause nutritional deficiencies unless you've got a really, really good, strong diet and getting plenty of protein. Now, <coughs> what happens with diet, um, it's a huge, huge topic on its own and it almost needs its own um, webinar, so to speak. So I have got two books, and I'm not just telling you this to buy my books. Um, I think they're really good. There's one, Eat Yourself Pregnant, when you're trying naturally to get pregnant, and there's the IVF diet as well. So it talks you through absolutely everything you need to do. It looks at detoxing, the whole thing. It's about building up your reserves, looking at your weight, looking at balancing your blood sugar, looking at the amount of protein, fats, and carbs you need to take, looks at gut health absorption and stress reduction. And they're all available on Amazon. <coughs> so next is looking at what an egg needs. Now this is a really basic diagram. But what an egg needs, it needs protein. And it needs more protein if you're going to IVF. Because when you think about when you're trying naturally, um, you just produce one egg. When you're going through IVF, there's a, you know, they want to get a good crop of eggs. So you do need more protein um, when you're going through that. You need to be able to absorb from your gut nutrients to be able to build eggs and sperm. You need a balanced blood sugar. You need a good blood flow to the whole of the pelvic area. You need protection from free radicals. Free radicals are a part of our metabolism and 
you know, at, at a little level, they're good. But you increase free radicals through stress, through drinking, through processed food, and they're damage, damaging to cells. An egg needs fat to cell membranes, and it needs to be protected from um, it needs to be protected from inflammation as well. But you know, when you think about the requirement for an egg to grow, to mature, to ovulate, to fertilize, to make an embryo, it needs energy, but also it needs balanced hormones. And you know, when you think about your cycle, um, and I, this is if you're trying naturally, it's an, a cycle is an ebb and flow throughout the month of different hormones that need to be present in the right amount at the right time for ovulation to happen. This all requires energy. So if you're depleted of nutrients, lack of sleep, poor diet, alcohol, too much sugar, this is all going to be detrimental to egg health. The egg is the largest cell in the body. And I always, when I see it in the medical journal, I always think it looks so majestic. It's got a real special quality about it. But different components are needed for different um, requirements of nutrients are needed for different parts of the egg. So, you know, when you think of the cells that surround the eggs, it contain follicular fluid. And what follicular fluid does is it bathes the egg um, in nutrients um, to help it mature. So things like myo-inositol, which I'll come on to talk about, vitamin D is really important, and there have been studies that have been done on this, um, are very, very good for egg health. So it, are things like beta-carotene, which you get from carrots, oranges, etc., all orange foods. Iodine is important also. Then when you look at the cell membrane of the egg, that is fat, and it needs to be flexible to be able to bring nutrients in and nutrients out of the cell. So omega-3 fats are really, really important for the membrane of the eggs. But omega-3 is also important for inflammation. It's important to build into your body before you get pregnant for fetal growth and needs. It's good for immune as well. And then you've got the uh, mitochondria and there's so much work now that's being done on the mitochondria which is the powerhouse of energy um, for the egg and it helps to process cr chromosomes correctly um, and when you think the energy that's required to produce these structures inside the egg be able to divide to be able to make an embryo is absolutely huge and mitochondria are found in nearly every cell in the body but in the um, mitochondria of the egg, they are, there's a huge amount, um, there's a huge amount present, more than 15,000, um, over 10 times more than any other cell in the body, which is incredible. Um, and again, there's a lot of work being done on mitochondrial health and age and quality. So ubiquinol and CoQ10 are really important for this part um, of the egg. The nucleus of the egg requires folate and folate impacts on egg quality. It's important for DNA and replication. Um, and again, it has a critical role in de uh, detoxification as well. Um, so very, very important in the form of folate and not um, folic acid. So as we age, yes, eggs get older. I know one was born with all the eggs she's ever gonna possess, but I do believe that the environment that those eggs are growing in, the nutrients that you take in, the supplements you take, can all help with egg health. So what does a sperm need? A sperm needs exactly the same as an egg, but a sperm is so much smaller. And men produce millions of sperm. And most of them are not normal. So, you know, out of 100% of sperm, only... 4% will be normal, which, you know, is, is surprising, isn't it? So it needs exactly the same. It needs a balanced diet, good weight, blood sugar, protein, fats, and carbs, good gut health absorption, and um, stress reduction. And again, through diet, but also through supplements, you can help improve sperm. Not for everybody, 
but certainly it's worth giving a go over three to four um, months. And I'm going to next do a, a bit of a whistle stop tour um, of the products. <clears throat> Just move on. Um, I started these products over 20 years ago now, and I started them as a result, like I said, of having postnatal depression, doing all the research, and there was so little around um, at the time. But I've always believed, even before we knew about things, the importance of nutrition and diet and support um, you know, for, for women and men. So I wanted to create this range that focused on areas of reproductive health. Um, and I wanted to, I'm very much involved in the formulations, which I love doing. Um, they're all made in the UK, backed by science and research, and there's a great team behind it all. Um, they're ethically sourced. But it's for me, it's not just about supplements. And I wouldn't want anybody to substitute supplement, supplements instead of their diet. It just helps with nutrient depletion. But for me, it's more about informing, educating, educating, and supporting women through a really difficult, a really difficult time. And um, so as I grow older, um, the range starts to grow as well. So um, what we now know, and I've talked a lot about um, the gut microbiome, but the microbiome now is becoming huge in the whole area of fertility and IVF and male fertility, which is really exciting. So for those that you, of you that don't know what the gut microbiome is, um, it, research shows now that in every area of medicine, it is important, um, you know, especially looking at pregnancy as well. So the microbiome is like an ecosystem within our bodies. It's a biological community, which consists of viruses, yeast, bacteria, that colonize and form communities inside us. So in our mouths, our intestines, our stomach, our gut, vagina, um, and sperm. And they all have different environments and different ecosystems. So um, what helps with these ecosystems is to have good, friendly bacteria. So different parts of the body have different bacteria and microbes, e.g. the skin is different from the vagina or the gut, but they also differ from person to person. So the idea is the more abundant, more diverse, more rich the species are, the better the health benefits are for fertility and pregnancy. So it's about rebalancing your microbiome, increasing the friendly bacteria, which helps reduce inflammation, helps with stress, helps with cells, helps with better immunity. And we're starting to understand now, and this is where I think it's a very exciting area, much more about the role of the vaginal microbiome when it comes to fertility and IVF. And the vagina has 250 different species, and no, new findings are starting to show us that it can have a significant impact on fertilization and IVF success. Um, and the strain that's involved in this, and there are many different strains, is lactobacillus. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm excited about this because now we're able to swap to see what the ratio of lactobacillus is in the vagina, but also we're able to take the right, correct um, probiotics to help with this. So, you know, who's it useful for? It's useful for women that have got endometriosis, it's useful, it acts as a regulator for inflammation with that. It's good for infection. It's good for after antibiotics. Um, and it helps achieve a balanced endometrial and vaginal microbiota. So it's preparing for um, egg transfer, uh, egg collection and transfer, and giving the optimum environment for imp implantation. And studies have shown this. Um, so women that have a good, endometrial vaginal microbiota have a higher success rate in both pregnancy and live birth. So, you know, it is an exciting area to be in and we're seven times more likely to achieve a, a pregnancy. And it's the same with men, you know, specifically, it can help with anti-inflammatory problems, anti, um, it can be an antioxidant, it can reduce inflammation, and it can help with DNA fragmentation. So again, Probiotics increasingly are becoming important for male fertility. 
So, you know, what I'm really um, excited about is that in two weeks time, um, we are increasing the range. So we will have a full range of probiotics, pre-probiotics for pregnancy, and also a Babel West, which is another part of the range to be help, able to help men and women. This will be available in two weeks time. We'll do an introductory offer for you. We'll let you know when it's in. Um, and we're, there will be, um, we'll give you all the information on it. So watch this space. Now, again, with nutrients, um, we do many, many products. Um, there's so much information available on our website. So just take a look. And I'd just sort of like to talk tonight about if you're trying naturally, what do you need? Um, and so again, vitamin D, there is so much information about vitamin D now, especially with COVID. Um, we test in the clinic vitamin D in males and females, and many women are very low in it. So if you're black or Asian, you're likely to be low. The studies can show that if you're low in vitamin D, it, it does have an impact on eggs and sperm because there are receptors on the eggs and the sperm that contain vitamin D. Looking at a multivitamin and mineral as well is important. Our multivitamin and minerals contain CoQ10, and they contain other antioxidants that are useful, such as um, NAC and alpha-lipoic acid. Pregnacon we do. Um, pregnancy plan is just a one a day um, product, whereas Vitafirm is three a day. So, you know, look, there's lots of information on the website about this uh, to be able to help you. Um, when you're having a bit more of a difficult time, um, you, you might need extra supplementation. So, you know, we look at coenzyme Q10, which is ubiquinol, which is absolutely excellent. We have myonositol and folate as well. And we have other antioxidants in our vitamin product, vitamin products. And looking at IVF, um, there's a lot that you can do and take alongside your diet to help with IVF. So this ensures that you're getting your omega-3, your vitamin D, you're helping with growing um, eggs, um, and we, we do this as a kit. So there's lots of bundles, there's lots of discounts um, on our website. So take a look. So going back now to the plan. So I hope you've been taking notes as you've been going along, but what I'm trying to encourage you to do is to work within a time frame. So those of you that are starting off trying, give yourself a time frame of six months of really trying, you know, looking at the areas that you need to improve on. If you're older, shorten the time that you're trying naturally and look for help. Don't look back and have any regrets. Reassess the areas in your life that you need to improve. Focusing on one area at a time. If you try and focus on too many things, it's not going to work. Um, look at your chart. What is your challenge? What changes do you need to make emotionally with your lifestyle? I'm going to go on to the other charts in a minute. And what adjustments do you need to make? And there's some questions that I want you to answer separately. So looking at your emotional health, you know, what were your life, your lowest scores? Where did they lie on what, you know, on what emotion? So what do you need to work at? What, you know, what area do you need to look at? And also, what are the triggers that cause these emotions and these emotional upsets for you? And what can you do to change it? What changes can you make to get a higher score or get on a better a better path and this could be therapy it could be hypnotherapy it could be counseling it could be breathing meditation yoga or just you know like the, the visualizations and guided visualization to help you get into a calm space moving on looking at the lifestyle changes um there are so many here and you know one of the questions I often ask to a woman or a couple is what else is going on in your life and besides going through IVF or trying to get pregnant it's like we're moving house we're living out of the microwave we're traveling the whole time you know so you know we're working long hours so many burdens on you so again taking a look at your lowest scores what happened 
you know, what you need to work on, you know, is it your relationship, you know, what relationships are draining your energy, are they draining your energy, looking at relaxation, your stress, um, what do you need to let go of in order to improve on certain areas, and you know, what's holding you back, is anything holding you back on any level, and you know what, helps so many women as well is journaling, writing it down, writing your thoughts and emotions down, and just getting a lot of it out on paper to be able to help you. So the final slide here is now that you've looked at both of those charts, I want, you know, what are the changes that you need to make? What are the changes you need to make medically? And that is looking at if you've got any underlying factors, irregular cycles, mother with um, a menopause, no periods coming off the pill, thyroid issues, you know, look at what you can do to move on, what extra tests that you might need to be done, have done. Looking at your nutrition and, you know, is it all or nothing? Working out what you can do for yourself. You know, are you drinking too much alcohol? Are you drinking too much coffee? Are you eating too many carbs? You know, I really do believe in building in treats. So the odd glass of wine isn't going to affect you, but a bottle of wine will. And the studies show that you don't drink at all in the lead up to getting pregnant, um, you, you, you have a higher chance. But I'm a realist, you know, if it takes eight to 12 months to get pregnant, a glass of red wine or whatever is not going to do you any harm at all. Um, but if you're going through IVF and you lead up to IVF, you shouldn't drink at all. Um, looking at coffee, yes, a cup of coffee is absolutely fine to have. Um, but, you know, 10 espressos a day isn't. You know, looking at your lifestyle, make it manageable for you. Within that chart, look at the areas that you scored the lowest in and just focus on those areas for the next couple of weeks. You know, your general health, building up your reserves, through sleep, through meditation is really important and exercise. And then work out again, what changes you need to make re your fertility and your IVF that are gonna help your mindset, gonna help your overall um, relaxation, your energy, um, et cetera. And just see what you can do for yourself. So I've come to the end and I know we've got a lot of questions so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to switch over to IGTV because we're running out of time on here and answer the questions that have come through. But I hope you've got a lot from this evening um, and I hope that you're taking something away from this that you're going to change. But thank you everybody for listening tonight. Um, the time has gone so quickly. And like I said, I hope you've got something from this. Um, I'm going to go on now to IGTV. Thank you very much, everybody.